Hello, and this week, Right On is devoted to just one programme. A programme that perhaps of all the World Service's output splits its listeners into diametric poles of love and hate. On hearing this, there are those who immediately reach for the off switch, while others slaver in adoration at the feet of the Grand Master of Modern Music. Hello again, dearly beloved. It's John Peel on the BBC World Service, and there's been much excitement in our house, this house, since last week, as uh, my wife Sheila and I have become grandparents. His name's Archie, and he's pretty good. Yes, it's the granddaddy of alternative popular music, John Peel. And he and his show are a phenomenon that either causes blood to boil or the heart to beat just a little bit faster. When I elicited a straw poll of your views, it was a request that evoked a torrent of mail. Vitriolic outpourings of bile on the one hand... The John Peel screech. A horrendous cacophony. A half hour for the deranged. A discordant din. Weird mechanical noises. The worst selection I've ever heard. John Peel's screeching banshees. Screeching music. Peel's music is a wonderful weapon against terrorism. <laughs> and reams of poetic adoration on the other. John Peel is not a DJ, but the question master of the world's most obscure cult status quiz show. Peel is a unique feature of the schedules and a national treasure. John Peel is God, not even a DJ. Peel's range defies categorization or squashing into a genre. A magnificent range from loud and aggressive to romantic and ethereal, from the latest recordings to classic blues. Peely provides an essential part of that diversity with music old and new from all parts of the globe. Peel is the best music selector ever. A genius, unpredictable, surprising and sound. And still the letters for and against come in. But love him or hate him... This week, thanks to an email from Annette Farkerson in Toronto, Canada, I'm going to try and get to the bottom of what makes the man and his music tick. And for the detractors amongst you, perhaps you might find that you too can learn, if not to love, at least to understand the more obscure corners to which his music takes you. The email from Annette runs thus. Dear Right On, I am a great fan of John Peel and most of the music he plays although some of it does my head in a bit. I mean that really weird screeching stuff that seems to have no tune, just a loud, discordant racket. I was wondering how he chooses it. He must get so many CDs to listen to every week. Does he listen to all of them? Is it always his choice, or does he have a producer who listens and chooses as well? And where does he record his programme? Is it from Bush House? What does he listen to when he wants to relax? Is it different from the stuff he plays on the radio? And does he really like all of the music he plays? It would be cool if you could find out. Cheers. So, that's exactly what I'm doing this week, with the help of John Peel's producer, Bobby Seiler, who, aside from minding John, also produces Charlie Gillett's World Music Show, the brand new music programme, White Label, a showcase for forthcoming big single releases, and, of course, the man himself, John Peel. Well, obviously, John gets quite a lot of correspondence from his show, both negative and positive, I'll be honest. Um, that may include demos, that may include just notes of affection for um, his family and for him, or it may be just musically related letters. So I have to collate all his correspondence, I sift out what's relevant and what's irrelevant, and I compile it and I make sure John is aware of what he's received and what he would maybe want to respond to. So it's made more of a supportive role when uh, you're producing John because John really is the master of his own show. He is the one whose taste is represented in that show. So John is the one who will choose all the records and he'll choose the order of the records as well. I try to prompt him in various directions. We get sent lots of records from around the world, demo records, records from people just in their bedroom, records from established bands. And all I can do is put them in front of John, let them hear them, and if he takes a liking to them, then maybe he'll play them. Otherwise, I go with what John goes with, because I think he's the best understander of his own taste. So does John know roughly how many records he gets sent a week? Well, funnily enough, I do occasionally count them, which would seem like a very strange thing to be doing, but just so I can answer questions like this. And in the average week, I get somewhere between 150 and 200 CDs. And do you listen to all of them? It would be impossible to do so, because if you uh, assess each one at 40 minutes, that still adds up to... Uh, 
more hours than there are in a week, I think, or comes pretty close to it. And you also have to bear in mind that I'm getting loads of 12-inch singles as well, because that's the format that most of the dance music is on, and uh, still one or two 7-inch singles and cassettes and stuff besides. So it would be impossible to listen to it, all, although I'd very much like to, and I feel very guilty about the fact that it's just not possible. So how do you set about listening to it, to some of it? Do you like the look of the cover? Do you like the look of the track? Do you like the look of the band title? What is it that makes you think, I'll have a listen to a bit of that one? Well, sometimes it is things as superficial as that, you know, nice artwork on the CD or something. But then, you you know, you, there are certain labels that you learn to trust and uh, certain towns that have produced a great deal of, of uh, unexpectedly worthwhile music and so on. So there are lots and lots of different signals that you pick up on or a producer's name that will be familiar to you or, or whatever. But it is a lot of it's very arbitrary, and I'm sure that I've missed out on a lot of... Uh, uh, excellent music, you know, just not recognising any of the signs, as it were. When you do decide a, a record comes in and you think, actually, that looks interesting, it's a good producer, it's a good label, how long does it take you to know that you really like it? I mean, is it a question of listening for the first ten seconds and thinking, yeah, that's good, or do you have to listen to the whole track? Well, ten seconds will usually do it. I mean, I do tend to listen to the whole track and because uh, I, I have a routine. You have to ritualise your life quite a lot, I'll be honest. And uh, when I get an LP, either on vinyl or on CD, uh, I tend to time all the tracks. And there's always far more tracks that I would like to play than I can play. John has a dedicated studio in his home and he records a lot of his shows, both for domestic stations and uh, for the World Service at his home studio. Now... Once he's done that, I get a copy of the show and I then set about cutting it, trimming it, touching it up in an editing suite to make sure that it fits the right length and duration of the programme and also that the levels are OK and any stutters or stumbles are all edited out. So I'm basically cleaning up his mess. It's a wonderful mess, though, obviously. As well as John's weekly half-hour show on the World Service, he also has three two-hour shows a week on Radio 1, that's the domestic pop music station here in the UK, which obviously gives him a bit more leeway. So I wondered if he had different criteria for choosing his records for his world service show, where obviously he's broadcasting his music, well, to the world. Well, it's, it's, it's in a, up to a point it's a kind of distillation of wisdom, if you like, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. I was just trying to pick the best... Uh, of the tracks that uh, I've heard during the week. But then there are also considerations like some of the uh, more extreme uh, records, particularly sort of fast guitar, you know, sort of hardcore punk things like that, are just going to be almost just noise coming out at the other end because you have to bear in mind that people aren't going to necessarily be listening on first-class equipment. There will be those that can and do, but then there are going to be people, you know, sitting out, I don't know where, but uh, uh, with primitive radios thinking, what the hell's going on here, and try and pick things that aren't going to distort too much, if you can help it. So you have to bear that in mind. Which may come as a surprise to those that might perhaps miss mistakenly think that John chooses records precisely for their distortion and screeching and unlistenable to quality. So how would he defend his choice of music? I asked John if he could try and explain what at least to him is the appeal of this so-called cacophony, this half hour for the deranged. Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't really know, and, I, and, and to be absolutely honest with you, I haven't got time to try and think of anything. Uh, I'm rather fr proud of half an hour for the, for the deranged, actually, I must say. But, uh, you know, I mean, pe different people like different things, and, you know, some of these people may admire enormously and adore the music of uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. You know, that's something which remains a closed book to me. But I don't... Uh, despise people who do like... Actually, I probably do. <laughs> <laughs> there was a track that you played a couple of weeks ago called... Uh, or by a band called Venetian Snares, yes. playing something called Einstein Rosen Bridge, which I think would be one of the more difficult ones. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't sound difficult to me or to a great number of other people. I mean, Venetian Snares is actually just one bloke. Uh, and uh, But it's very popular. He's regarded as being... Uh, you know, one of the leaders in his field, whatever that field is, and it's just electronic music. It's perhaps a little faster and harder than the bulk of electronic music, but, I mean, electronic music these days encompasses as vast a range as music can encompass, and he's at uh, one end of it, and it's the stuff's exciting and hard and well worth playing on the radio, I think. And obviously you, don't, you know that uh, for everybody to like all of the records that are in the programme, they'd virtually have to be me, which was not, was not something I'd wish on anyone. <laughs> 
got something of an enigmatic response from John Peel, I turned to his producer, Bobby Seiler, to see if he could perhaps shed a bit more light on the appeal of this sort of, well, difficult music. This is maybe more difficult music to immediately understand, but it does have merit. It's different, it's progressive, it's um, reaching out to the outer reaches of the musical spectrum. And for that reason, I think it has a validity. And um, maybe it asks the listener to try a little harder in their listening process, rather than just lapping up what is given to them. I think Venetian Snares is a perfect example of something that twists your mind around, but it can lead you to an interesting place. Um, and for that reason, I think it's very valid. <laughs> Do you really like all the music you play? Yeah, I, I genuinely do, yes. I mean, it, I, I realise it encompasses a, a wide range of things, but that seems to me to be a natural and normal human condition, you know, and in the same way that I don't, as I say, very often listen to old records because in the way that I don't read old newspapers, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the things that have happened and so forth, and uh, if my attention is drawn to them again by hearing them on the radio, I don't dismiss them immediately, but uh, my own interest is in hearing what I've not already heard. And as for Bobby, does he, like some listeners, find that there are some tracks that John chooses that are, well, pretty unlistenable to? Absolutely. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit here and say that I love John's music 100%. What I will say is that I believe with most music programmes, I actually probably only like about 40% of the music. It just so happens with John's 40%, I love it passionately, right across the board from his angular, slightly difficult electronic music to his loud, brash guitar music to his soft, quiet, thoughtful music as well. Um, that's one of the things I love about John Peel. He covers just about every bass you could imagine. But aside from the alternative, electronic, difficult stuff... Is there one particular style of music among the eclectic mix that he plays that's a personal favourite? Um, well, so yes and no. I mean, it, it depends very much on on mood, really, and, and uh, sometimes you're feeling sentimental, and there are times when, uh, if I'm listening to records at home, which happily I'm usually doing, and uh, something like Roy Orbison's Greatest Hits goes on, uh, my wife Sheila knows it's time to make a cup of tea and come in and make a fuss of me because I'm approaching some kind of mini-crisis. Pretty woman, walking down the street, pretty woman, the kind I like to meet, pretty woman. Is that the sort of music you play to relax to, if you really want to chill out and calm down? Not really, no, because I, 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 in a sense I don't have the opportunity to listen to music for pleasure in that sort of way or for relaxation, because uh, I listen to everything with a view to playing it on the radio, which is why I don't actually listen very often to old records. But I said when the Roy Orbison uh, Greatest Hits uh, LP goes on, and I, it's mainly so I can shriek along with the... Uh, go for all those high notes. It's probably how I will die, Dilly. <laughs> There'll be a vein will snap in my forehead and it'll be goodbye, cruel world, as I strive for the high notes in running scared. <laughs> and on that high note, my thanks to John Peel and Bobby Siler. And don't forget the right-on competition.